here this morning. It's good to have Jennifer back with us. I'm glad she's back from Hawaii now. I feel real bad for her about being on the Hawaii. <laughs> but, uh, glad she's back. And, uh, and also Elmer. Elmer had a fall here a couple weeks ago. Uh, he has been back. He says you're feeling a little bit better. Uh, but continue to, to pray for Elmer as well. Well, I want to start by talking about our 4th of July picnic. It was absolutely wonderful. And I'll tell you, I know that uh, uh, we had called over to uh, the shelter to see if uh, Nancy had called over to the shelter to see if it was available this year. And praise the Lord, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, what we were able to do this year with hot scrambled eggs right out of the pan, sausage and bacon, and I'm going to make everybody hungry, uh, sausage and bacon, and we had tables lining the entire hallway up uh, filled with those kind of food and casseroles, and we had 42 people here. That was absolutely wonderful. And you know, another thing too, the contrast to that, we, we were here in our air conditioning with the kitchen and the facilities right here at us. Over there, by the time we finished eating, it was so hot and humid, we were all ready to go home. Nobody wanted to sit around and talk because of that. So I hope this will become an annual event here uh, and not at the picnic show, but it was, it was just, just entirely too good. Um, another thing, too, um, Buddy buddy's stepped out for just a minute, but I know Buddy caught me off guard a little bit last week because we, 4th of July, we said the flag to the American flag. And um, they said, what about the Christian flag? Well, they caught me off guard. I wasn't prepared for that. Don and Act uh, volunteered uh, right after church. He said, I'll go home and pray for you. Well, Buddy had gotten with Gail, and for Tuesday on the 4th of July celebration, Gail had brought in the pledge, the Christian flag, and the pledge to the Bible, and Donna had furnished the same thing. So next time we get ready to do that, we've got plenty, and we appreciate both of you all uh, helping and providing information uh, on that. So anyway, what a wonderful, wonderful time, and uh, I just can't thank the Lord enough for all that he provided for us uh, on that. Um, continue to pray for Linda. Uh, the, she left early, a little bit after services last week, to have an MRI of her eye. Um, everything went well, but she hadn't heard anything back. And so she's going to call, call tomorrow because she's got a free op scheduled for Friday. And her uh, cataract surgery is July the 25th, so you may want to make a note of that. But she needs to make sure that everything is in order uh, and that she can have the pre-op Friday and the surgery on the 25th. I uh, talked to the pastor this morning when he came in. Leanne is feeling better today. So we thank God for his grace and mercy as it relates to Leanne. And pray for, uh, for uh, Pastor Matt. Uh, he's been working a lot. And he told me a little while ago, he just didn't realize how tired he was finishing up uh, his other job is in transition. He'll be going into orientation for his new job tomorrow, and then uh, will be in training uh, for a few days. I told him that he was so familiar with it, he'd probably be training the trainers. But uh, <laughs> so I don't think that's going to be any issue. But it'll be a few days for him to get acclimated into into his new job. So pray for him uh, for that. Good to see Bill. Bill, I hope you're doing feeling okay. All right, got a thumbs up on that one. So that's good. Uh, Sylvia, continue to pray for Sylvia, as we mentioned last week, and again on July the 15th, they'll be moving more stuff out of her house, getting ready to put her house on the market the 1st of August, and that has got to be an extremely trying and difficult um, experience for, for Sylvia, so I'll be with her. Pray for Eloisa while she's traveling, and I have some really, really good news for you. Um, I, I checked with Mike and not well, Mike and Kathy, but primarily Kathy Weeks on a very regular basis to keep up with Frank and Cheryl. So the last time they were waiting back from results of the Heritage Dream and about his uh, Frank's clearing of his therapy before he could leave. And I, 
got this message uh, late last night. A room has become available, so Kathy, her sister, and the hubbies uh, went over to Frank and Shirley's house, got furniture, and took it to Heritage. We decorated the room and anticipate that Dad will be moving in the following week. Um, please tell everyone, thank you so much for your continued prayers and cards. It is greatly appreciated. Love all you guys. So, uh, and there were some pictures here I wish I could share with you. You can't see them. But uh, they sent pictures of the room, had it all decorated, had a dresser with pictures and things of the family. So uh, things seem to be moving along nicely for, for both Frank and Shirley as well. Um, continue to pray for Sue. Uh, she's still hobbling around. We've got a little bit of foot pain here, so it's going to be a while. So continue to pray for Sue uh, as she's healing uh, from that broken bone in her foot. And pray for the Vaughn family as well. And don't forget, I like to announce every week that we have extra copies of the prayer list, so that if you're not here on Wednesday night, please take the opportunity to pick up the prayer list and, and take a look at the many, many things that are on there uh, that we just simply don't have time to share uh, in, in this. Okay, coming up, the next thing. On Tuesday, Tuesday the 11th, Al Pierce has got a birthday. I know he's out in the hallway, but wish Al a happy birthday for Tuesday. Deanna Vaughn has got a birthday on Friday the 14th. Now, I have put her address, her home address, uh, in Georgia. So if you care to send her a card or reach out to her, text message, whatever you want to do, um, Deanna's birthday is on, on the 14th. And um, Christina will be having a birthday on Saturday, July the 15th. So happy birthday to each of, each of these folks. Now, Timing is everything, but however, uh, I was going through the mail when I came in to print the prayer list this week. I came in and I found a stack of mail on the, on the desk, and I found some very, very good information I wish I had had to read last week for the 4th of July. I didn't have it, but it's still, I think, very applicable, and the information that we have here, this comes from Christian Law Association. These are one of the folks that we support every month and their monthly magazine, a monthly paper, is called uh, The Legal Alert. And it says, The Gospel of Matthew records the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Part of the life-changing sermon says, You are a light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. And that's taken from Matthew 5.14. Some of the earliest English settlers in America well aware of this verse. For example, when John Winthrop was aboard the Arabella, he delivered a famous uh, sermon entitled, A Model of Christian uh, Charity, referring to Matthew 5.14. Winthrop preach, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of the people are upon us. This example demonstrates that the United States is a strong, has a strong Christian heritage, but countless of other examples could be identified. When the Pilgrims arrived in New England on November the 11th, 1620, they signed the Mayfair Compact, which begins, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. During the Constitutional uh, Convention and Vengeance Franklin asserted, I have lived, sir, for a long time, and the longer I live, the more convinced proof that I see that this truth, that God governs over the affairs of man, and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire will not rise without his aid. As Christians in America, we can truly be thankful for our religious, religious heritage. At the same time, we cannot suppose that our religious reason, freedom will endure forever if we do not actively do our part to assure that it does. It is a uh, practical sense uh, that we all have a Bible, but do we read it? And so, almost pointless to say that we have a constitutional freedom to share the gospel if we would only do so. 
While there are many citizens who wander far from the faith of our founding fathers, God still has faithful Christians who fervently care about our nation. May we never cease to pray for our gracious Heavenly Father who will continue to bless the United States of America. And one little thing I thought was very interesting, why do we celebrate the 4th of July with fireworks? Fireworks has always been associated with the 4th of July for centuries. In tracing this history, some people point a letter that John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail. I am apt to believe that the 4th of July will be celebrated and commemorated in succeeding generations as the greatest anniversary festival. It ought to be commended by a day of deliverance, by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be with pomp and parade and shows and games and sports, guns and bells and bonfires and illuminations from one end of the continent, our continent, to the other. For this is the freedom that we have yeah. evermore. And this is by John Adams. One quick thing, I know I'm taking too long, but one quick thing that I want to let you know, since this is a legal alert, this comes out on a regular basis. But in case you ever run across anybody that needs any help, a ministry of legal alert uh, from CLA, Christian Law Association, Free legal defense for those facing difficulties in biblical faith. Free legal counsel to churches and Christians for their ministries. Legal books and other sources to inform Christians of their rights. Weekday radio programs and legal work as more than 1,586 outlets for that program. The legal work is a public newspaper, a monthly published newspaper. Free legal counseling to local, state, federal officials and legislators to provide maximum religious liberty. An accessory prayer uh, ministry for requests sent to our ministry offices. Free legal help to homeschool families. Prayer, uh, prayer initiative for our na uh, national leadership and government. Legal seminars for ministers to help prevent lawsuits and preaching in churches across our country. So this is quite a bit, quite a bit that they that they have to offer. Uh, and one final thing, uh, Pastor's message this morning is going to be on justifications, Romans 4, 24, and 25. And there will also be a um, public committee meeting uh, this afternoon at 1. Our next ladies' um, uh, craft day is going to be Friday, July the 21st. So take a look, sign up, and be prepared. For that. I have one other thing, I don't have time to get into it, but I'm going to be prepared for next week. Um, quite frankly, I got a very disturbing letter from Chris Stigner last night. Uh, the situation in Ecuador, if you can remember back for our people that have been here for a while, can remember while Danny Walker he left the field of Mexico and it had to do with violence and things that are going on there. Uh, it is absolutely frightening of what's going on in Chris's area right now. So I'll have more to say in more detail to give you about Chris. But in the meantime, I want you to pray uh, for Chris uh, and his ministry and the protection for his family because one of the biggest things is kidnapping and uh, violence. And, and it's right in the area where Chris lives. So please, please be in prayer uh, for Chris. Now, this morning, I know that we typically call on someone to come up and pray, but I wanted to do something a little different. Since we have the uh, pulpit committee meeting this afternoon, uh, I would like for each and every one of you to be praying for the pulpit committee, uh, for Pastor Matt, who's been so helpful to us, and each of us in making the decision. We're making progress, so I would like now, if you don't mind, to each one of you, just bury your head, bow your heads for a few moments, and pray for that meeting for this afternoon.
turn to page 292. 292. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The, the, the bailiffs, the policemen, 
had to pay 50 cents. Uh, the defendants of petty violations that were in that room had to pay 50 cents. Even the baker had to pay 50 cents because the woman stole bread from him. The newspaper blotter recorded the proceedings the next day, including that the entire room gave the mayor a standing ovation. This story illustrates theologically what we call justification. God declares a confessing believer as a sinner who is no longer guilty. That's justification. Justification makes us accepted by God in Christ. As a believer, that is your identity. Your first and primary identity, accepted by God in Christ. Do you understand that? You're going to hear me say it time after time in this message. When Christ died on the cross for our sins, he did much more than just forgive us. You know, it's one thing to have forgiveness, but it's another thing to have a good relationship after that forgiveness is, is given and received. Uh, for example, a husband and wife have these uh, periodic weighty philosophical debates, otherwise known as arguments. Uh, sometimes they get heated, and it goes on for an hour or more, and, and they love each other, but at the moment they don't like each other very much. You ever been there? Uh, eventually one relents, and they acknowledge that they were wrong, and they ask for and receive forgiveness. And again, it's one thing to have forgiveness, but it's another thing for that relationship to continue moving forward. And that's when the best part of the arguments happens. You know, the, the making up. Oh, the, the husband and wife, and they hug and they kiss. That's my favorite indoor sport, you know? <laughs> they, they, they assure each other of their commitment to each other. They restore confidence in each other, and that's how they know their relationship is right. Justification provides the foundation for a right relationship with God because our sins have been forgiven. We call that right relationship righteousness. When God looks on a believer, when he looks upon you through his son, Jesus Christ, he declares that person not guilty. He then offers the joy of a relationship with him on that basis, and, and justification establishes confidence that settles us eternally. We're now at peace with God. And if you take one application from this doctrine, let it be this. I'll stand confidently at peace with God. I'll stand confidently at well, as we look at our text with here, we see, first of all, that justification, justification happens only once. Look, at, if you would, here at uh, verse 24, at the, at the last half of it. To whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our, our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, because of this, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever justified yourself? Uh, you might think you haven't, but we actually do it more often than we, we might realize. Uh, Reader's Digest offers humorous examples of how we justify ourselves. They, they compile a list of the funniest excuses given for why a person missed work. Uh, one employee explained that they accidentally got on an airplane. <laughs> Another explained that he had to miss work or to attend a funeral for his wife's cousin's pet because he was both an uncle and a pallbearer. Uh, one woman excused herself because she got bats in her hair. Uh, and then there was a the fellow who said that he was in a really good mood and didn't want to ruin it. And I worked at a few places where I'd say he lied, but I couldn't identify with that one. Whenever we make an excuse, we try to justify our actions. We explain why we were right to do what we did. Someone once said excuses are lies wrapped in reason lie about our motives when we make excuses. Mm -hmm. Justification isn't always negative, though. If, if the police took you for questioning about a crime you, and you gave an alibi for that time of the crime, in this case, you justified why you didn't do something wrong because you were doing something else. Uh, justification applies to our spiritual lives, too. Uh, think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They ate the fruit and then they hid themselves thinking God was playing a game of hide-and-seek. When God came into the garden, they hastily made uh, aprons out of leaves and then hid in the bushes. And when God found them, as if he could, they could really hide from someone who's all present, he asked them what they had done and why. And, and Adam said, God, it's your fault because the woman you gave me convinced me to eat. And Eve said, the snake tricked me into eating. And, and God looked at the snake, and he didn't have anyone to blame. 
Adam and Eve tried to justify why eating the fruit was actually the right thing to do. But it wasn't. God passed a curse on all of humanity in Adam. And from that point on, we were not right with God. Nor could we be. There, there's no possible reason we could give to explain why we deserve anything from God except an eternity under his wrath. <laughs> And in order to enjoy the blessings of eternal life, we must be justified, and we can't do that for ourselves. Someone must do it for us. Uh, let, let's say that I wanted to become a member of my favorite football team. I, I can't just walk up to the ticket office on game day and say, I'm here to suit up. Uh, someone must introduce me to the general manager who hires and, and fires players, and, and someone must vouch that I'm qualified to, to play, and then secondly, I would be a good fit for the team. Someone other than me must justify why I should be part of the team. We can't justify ourselves before God. Right. Our text tells us that there is someone who can. His name is Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus died and rose again, providing justification. We can experience justification by faith in Christ alone. Mm. What then is justification? It's a one-time event where God declares a believer not it's not an acquittal in which charges against the person are dropped. The declaration doesn't say that the believer was never a sinner. There's sufficient evidence of our spiritual crimes and, and someone paid the penalty for those crimes. We are indeed guilty, but God declares that that guilt is now removed from us. And when God looks upon the believer's faith, he declares that they will never again face the consequences of their guilt. How is our guilt removed? See an interesting word there in the first verse we read, verse 24, a term called imputation. It means to put something on something else. Uh, every now and then, when, when Lee and I are, are together, I, I impute on her. I impute something there. I see that she's cold, and so I'll take my jacket and I'll drape it over her shoulders. I have imputed my jacket upon her. And this illustrates what happens with our guilt. Jesus bore the guilt and shame of our sins. He took that upon himself. Our sin was and guilt was imputed upon him as he hung on the cross. And at the moment a person believes on Jesus for salvation, Jesus' righteousness, all that makes him absolutely beloved and accepted by, to God, is placed on us. Jesus takes our guilt. We bear his righteousness, his sinlessness. If you looked in a Bible reading words, you could discover something rich and deep that doesn't really translate well from Greek to English here. In verse, in, in verse 1, the words that just translate, we've been justified as a present passive participle. I'm a grammar guy. I like grammar. Um, I used to teach grammar, but it's a junior high. And I, I just, I'm, I'm just that way. I'm not a grammar Nazi. I'm just, I like grammar. <laughs> so a present passive participle is, let, let's exa use an example here. We could say the road is being fixed. It's a past event with continuing effects or consequences. It's not a repetition of events like renewing your driver's license or, or filing your taxes each year. It's a one-time action. Let's apply this to justification. Justification, again, is a one-time act of God with continuing effects. It's not something God has to renew periodically. Uh, it, it isn't a process that grows or evolves with the passing of time like a child maturing into adulthood. God declared us justified at the moment of faith, and that declaration will never, never change. When God declares a person to be just, that's the final word. Right. It's all well and good to know that, that we will no longer meet with the consequences of our guilt. Why is that important? Well, justification cancels a performance-based lifestyle. A misunderstanding exists generally because of a lack of clear teaching on, on justification in churches today. Again, justification is a one-time event, a legal declaration at the moment of salvation. Sanctification, the process for, whereby we can better at living the Christian life. We'll talk about this in a few weeks here. But sanctification is a process that begins at the moment of salvation. And if we mix these two doctrines together, we say in effect that our salvation depends upon us rather than upon God. 
We must cooperate with God to maintain our holy standing. And if we ever cease to cooperate with God, we lose our salvation. And salvation becomes a, a base, it became, uh, salvation becomes based on works rather than on grace. For example, some go to passages like Matthew 23, where Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And concluding from this verse, some say that we have to clean up our act before God will save us. And, and, and additionally, they also say we as believers have to clean up our act before God will let us serve him. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The Pharisees weren't believers here in this, verse, in this text. Jesus wasn't telling them to clean up their act. He was pointing out the irony that what they did outwardly wasn't true inwardly. They were hypocrites. They, they looked like they were right with God, but they were filled with greed, envy, and spite. They looked good outwardly, but their desires and motives were completely corrupt. And as long as we do what we do for others to see us, we might look good, but God sees what's inside of us. Eventually, what's inside of us will come out. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in Luke 6, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. If you bump a cup of tea, coffee doesn't spill out. Tea does. You say the things that already fill your heart. That word you spoke in a moment of frustration and anger was probably truer than anything else you said before or after. The devil knows this is true of each of us. And though he does not know everything, he's not all knowing. He can't read your mind. But he is a master psychologist. He's been studying the human race for thousands of years. And he knows which buttons to push. He whispers in our ears that we're how do we respond to the devil's accusations? And we see the next year, and again, this is the heart of justification. I am accepted by God in Christ. Yes. At one or time or another, we've all had to come to grips with the guilt of something we did in the past. Zechariah 3 provides a revealing picture of how Satan accuses us of our past guilt. Zechariah the prophet sees this following vision. He says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It is, it is not this a brand plucked out of the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. And so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Satan stood next to Joshua the high priest to accuse him of sin. That's exactly what the name Satan means, the accuser. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan, the accuser of our brothers, referring to believers, he accuses us day and night. He does all of this all the time, every day. He stands next to us saying, hey, remember that time you did that? Uh, how about that time you did this? And you call yourself a, a Christian. You're a hypocrite. You're worthless. us over our head with our faults, and never mind that we've already confessed those sins to God. It reminds us of what we were before we were justified, before we were accepted by God in Christ. And as you turn that memory in your mind over and over like a Rubik's Cube, and, and the weight of your guilt begins to crush you, and the memory of that guilt is exactly what he intends to accomplish. He will not allow us to forget our shortcomings. But because of justification, no one will stand before God to accuse us fairly of our sins ever again. God, the final judge, justifies. 
Jesus' resurrection is the greatest evidence that we have that final declaration of forgiveness. A story is told many years ago of a woman, an immigrant woman, who took the United States citizenship test. And candidates at that time could not get more than four answers on the test wrong, and this woman had five answers wrong. And one of the questions was, what is the Constitution? Of course, the correct answer is that it's one of our nation's governing documents, but the woman who lived in Boston thought the answer was a ship in Boston Harbor. <laughs> and her husband argued with the judge that she answered the question correctly. Mm -hmm. So that he didn't have to keep arguing, the frustrated judge declared her to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. After that day, the woman was still afraid, even though she was declared a citizen. She still knew that she hadn't really passed the test. Whenever she saw a policeman, she avoided him, and fearing that, that she would be deported even though she was a citizen. Many years later, she returned to her home country, and yet she was still anxious that the authorities wouldn't let her back into the country because she answered five questions incorrectly. Sometimes we as believers can be that way. At the moment of our salvation, Christ completely covered our guilt, and we're accepted by God in Christ, and he declares us to be sons and daughters. God looks upon us as we've never sinned. And we call that wonderful reality justification. But So we as Christians no longer need to labor under that crushing weight of guilt. The grace of God freed us from our guilt when Jesus died in our place. That reality makes Romans 8, 1, it's such a precious verse. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the we still labor under that load of guilt. The story may sound familiar. Many years ago, Jim spoke with his friend Ernie about guilt in his life. And, and Jim explained that he'd done something terribly wrong in his past, and, and he felt guilty about it still. And, and the guilt was so great that he wept as he told the story. He said something that you've probably heard others say, maybe even have thought or said yourself, I know God can forgive me, but I just can't forgive myself. Jesus meets this need. Because of the cross, we will never meet with our guilt again. Micah 7, 19 tells us that Jesus took our guilt from us and cast it into the deepest sea. Our guilt is as irretrievable as if we dropped an anvil over the deepest trench of the ocean. Because of Jesus, God will never use our guilt against us again. So perhaps you're here this morning, you're laboring under a load of crushing guilt for some sin that you've, you've done in the past. And you said the same thing as Jim, I just can't forgive myself. Let me ask a simple question. Is your forgiveness greater than God's? Is Jesus' work not enough? Must something more be added to God's forgiveness and to Jesus' deal with that guilt. First, believe in the completeness of God's forgiveness. A story told of a boy and his sister playing in their grandparents, uh, grandparents' barnyard. <clears throat> the grandma's favorite duck waddled around, following them wherever they went. And they gave the boy a brand new slingshot, but warned him not to use it on any of the animals. And of course, you know how that's going to go. <laughs> the boy saw the duck and without thinking about it, pulled a rubber band and let a shot fly, and the stone hit the duck, killing it immediately. He tried to hide the dead duck, but his sister saw everything, and she told him that she would tell on him unless he did her chores for a month. <laughs> Guilty that he killed Grandma's favorite duck, he agreed, and for the next week, his sister held his crime against him, and he did everything that she asked. As the week drew to an end, the boy just couldn't take the strain any longer. With tear-filled eyes, he told his grandmother what happened, and she hugged him and told him that she'd seen it all, too. She said that she already forgave him and wondered how long it would take for him to, to confess what he'd done. That's what justification does for us. It assures us that we have more than mere forgiveness. We have a right relationship with God. We are at peace with him. That's what Joshua the high priest's change of clothing represented in Zechariah 3. When we believe on God for salvation, he takes the filthy rags of our sins and puts the pure white linen of Jesus' robe upon us. 
And he declares us to be righteous, not just not guilty, but righteous, right with him, at peace with him. We're in a right relationship with him. Whatever God declares can never be undone or reversed. Your justification is complete, and final, and eternal. And though your emotions may not sense it, you may trust that God's word is don't embrace the truth of justification. Nothing else will matter. You'll continue under this heavy load of crushing guilt. Another step you might take regarding your guilt is to consider what, if anything, needs to be made right in that situation. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has ought against you, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy guilt. Uh, offer thy gift. Y your guilt may be in part that you've not reconciled with the person against whom you did wrong. Go to that person. Ask forgiveness and offer to make things right. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we won't still experience the consequences of our sin. And you will have to make some sort of restitution. I'm not talking about penance, voluntary punishment. Christ already bore the punishment. But you can't add to what Jesus did. Jesus covered your guilt. So restitution is doing whatever needs to be done to make sure that the situation is right again. Another thing we need to do is to ask for grace. Ask for God to give you the grace to overcome the memory of that situation, especially if you're not able to make it right or if you've done everything necessary to make it right. You know, memory is a funny thing as it affects our, our perceptions as opposed to others. So, well, we might remember, uh, have, might have been something that was forgotten or considered unimportant by someone else. That thing haunts our memories, may not have been a source of offense for someone else. So that leads us also then, don't trust your emotions. Emotions are, are also funny things. They, they tell us that one, things are one way when they're actually quite different. They can be so powerful that they control the way we think and react, and, and if we're not careful, we allow our emotions to become the litmus test of our experience. Mm. In other words, we allow our emotions to trump the truth. <clears throat> what we feel emotionally becomes more important than anything else. And this leads to false assumptions about motives and purposes of the people around us. Again, the devil knows how to pluck your emotional strings like a one-string banjo. Right. He'll use whatever chord he thinks he can use against you to turn you against the people around you. Mm. He'll use whatever tricks he thinks he can to make you feel threatened and vulnerable. And this is why Paul speaks of the shield of faith in, in Ephesians 6. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the, the shield of faith it, it extinguishes Satan's flaming arrows. Amen. When emotions begin to swell, rely on the truth about uh, that you know about God rather than your own perceptions or emotions. And then we also see there the helmet of salvation falls hard on the heels of the shield of faith. So the helmet protects the head. It's a head wound effectively diminishes a person's effectiveness, even threatens life. The helmet of salvation is important because how you think is crucial. We must protect our thinking. So we read in Corinthians, bringing everything into captivity to the knowledge of our salvation must impact every thought we have. How? If we become too distracted by the struggles of this life, we might forget why we're fighting. We might forget the hope of salvation, which is the future time when our faith will be sight, when our, our, our fellowship will never be broken again. The promise of our ultimate salvation at Christ's return ought to give you hope. So ask the Lord for grace to look beyond your emotions, to to clear your thinking so you can focus on the truth of justification. I am accepted by God in Christ. Whatever you feel emotionally does not change your position in Christ. When I woke up this morning, I didn't feel saved. <laughs> You're accepted by God no matter what you feel. Right. Another thing we can do is, in everything, give thanks. Thank God for his gift of forgiveness. First John 2 says, My little children, these things... Write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, 
have Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is basically a defense attorney. Jesus is our defense attorney. He stands before the Father eternally to plead our case. He says, Father, Matt believes on me for salvation. Please accept him. That's justification. Your justification, your acceptance by God will come to an end when Jesus stops pleading your case. And you know what? He will never do that. You may thank God that he has forgiven you and accepted you because of your faith in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. There's a great remedy for our guilt. There is no condemnation for those who are in believed on Christ for salvation, you took the guilt of your sin, and the law of double jeopardy applies. You will never again be tried for your sins because Christ took care of on the cross once for all. The next time Satan accuses you, the only way you can fight these fiery darts he hurls, that he hurls at you is by faith. Believe that Christ took your sins and removed your guilt, and trust that you stand as a son or a daughter before the Pray for the Lord to help you at that moment, and he will. If you're here today, watching online, have never placed your faith in Christ, and you live under the constant fear that your sins will catch up with you, and you can try to drown that, that fear in alcohol or drugs, relationships, hobbies, good things. You can pretend that you've not sinned. You can try to escape that fear by self-redeeming activities. You simply cannot redeem. You simply cannot justify yourself. Right. Someone must do it for you. Mm -hmm. And nor can you simply trust that your good works will be good enough. Mm. We're not basically good, although we made a few mistakes along the way. We cannot just follow Christ's example to become better people. Being a Christian isn't like putting on the jersey of our favorite sports team. Jesus doesn't want or need fans. Come to grips with your own spiritual bankruptcy. You're completely sinful, which means that God does not accept you. And if this is the end of the story, we would have every reason to despair. But there's good news. Romans 5 8 says, God commended, He demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Jesus didn't die for our self improvement, He died in our place while we were still sinners. You'll place your faith in Jesus' work on the cross. You will never need to fear that God will hold your sins against you. And you'll receive the citizenship of Christ's kingdom with all the blessings of a right relationship with God, at peace with God, because we are accepted by God in Christ. Will you place your faith in Jesus today? We draw to a close. Have you ever been to a circus and saw a monkey acting like a person? You know, they wear human-like clothing, like they ride tricycles. And they can mimic humans, but you know what? They aren't human. A person can look and act like they're a neighbor. But the outward appearance doesn't count with God. He looks to see if a person wears the robe of Jesus' righteousness, and when he sees that, then God accepts the believer as justified. Our acceptance before God impacts the way we see ourselves. Yes, we were at one time sinners, guilty and deserving eternal punishment. punishment. But because of faith, Jesus removes our guilt and we will never again meet with it. Our sins will never be brought against us as evidence. And when we grasp this reality, it creates a joy in our hearts because we're now at peace with God. It motivates us to keep our relationship with him it moves us to, to, to be right and to make right uh, things with the people in our lives. And this way, justification becomes the foundation of every moment of the day. I am accepted by God in Christ. May the Lord give us the grace to hear and to do his work. Let's pray. <clears throat> I invite you in the silence of the next few moments to allow the Holy Spirit to continue.
and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you today. We've heard many things that are hard for us to understand. We've seen your perfect holiness and love demonstrated in Christ, and there's still a part of us that rears up and says, I'm not all that bad. We also tremble with fear because while we know that you love us, we sometimes just aren't sure that you like us. We've enslaved ourselves to our arbitrary rules of religion, being as good a Christian as we can be, and we've ceased resting in your son's finished work and faithful decree. Lord, forgive us. Give us renewed vision of your justification so that we may have hope and confidence. Lord, we ask for the justification of the person who is here today who has never placed his or her faith in your son. May today be the day their soul responds to your spirit's gentle pleadings. And we pray all these things in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to do end of service just a little differently here this morning. There was a second handout you received at the title is at the top is the title before the throne of God above. We're going to sing this to the tune of Sweet Hour of Prayer. So you'll hear her playing one song. Sing the words that you see here. Alrighty, let's stand as we sing. <laughs> week to live by grace in that peace. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.